Good evening. I'm Terry Gosliner, and I'm the Dean of Science and Research Collections and the Hind Chair here at the Academy. And it is a real pleasure to welcome you back to the Academy. Uh, tonight, we are going to have a very special treat. But before we do that, I want to thank all of you as trustees, members, and donors, the real core of the supporters of this venerable institution, and one that is really transforming the way that people understand and engage with science. Um, as we approach the end of the year, I would like to urge you to continue to support the Academy <laughs> and perhaps make a year-end contribution that is really the lifeblood to really bring this whole stage for science, the opportunities where we can really have our scientists engage with members of the public and particularly with young people who are the, going to be the next generation of scientists. So from that standpoint, thank you again. And when we talk about the friends of the Academy, many of you are very familiar faces and long-standing friends, and it's not just something that we say lightly. You are the friends of the Academy. Um, I wanted to also mention that this evening we're going to hear from one of my newest colleagues, um, Dr. Shannon Bennett. And Shannon just celebrated her first year anniversary at the Academy about a week and a half ago. Um, Shannon is um, a microbiologist, as you will soon learn more about. But more importantly, she brings a whole new area of expertise to the Academy. We're the only natural history museum in the world that has a curator of microbiology. Um, that is a really exciting thing for the Academy. We've studied a lot of the diversity of life on the planet, and Shannon brings the expertise of beginning to understand much more of that diversity that still remains to be discovered. And how that relates to human health and well-being. Um, Shannon, is, was, before she came to the Academy, was associate professor at the Asia Pacific Institute for Tropical Medicine and Infectious Diseases at the University of Hawaii. And that tropical experience has threaded through her life. One of the things that I learned this evening, and you always learn things about your colleagues at, in situ, that she worked her way through college by being a cockroach handler. And I, maybe she'll talk to you about that during the, but we all make a living the, in any way we can in the world of science. And, and sometimes that takes us in very different, interesting paths. Um, during the seven years that she was at the University of Hawaii, she led a number of research projects on virus evolution, their identification and transmission. And, received a lot of funding and currently has funding from the National Institutes of Health. Prior to her work at the University of Hawaii, she researched dengue virus in Puerto Rico and parasitic roundworms in Texas and Vancouver at University of British Columbia. She received her bachelor's from McGill University and her PhD in zoology from the University of British Columbia. Without further ado, please welcome my dear colleague, Dr. Shannon Bennett. Thanks, Terry, um, and thank you, everybody, for coming, and thank you to the Academy for being such a, a supportive atmosphere to work in. I have a beautiful research lab in the basement of this building where I study many of the organisms I'm going to talk to you about today, and I've had nothing but excitement from my colleagues. I think of them as experts on host groups because we are teeming with host groups that are in turn teeming with, uh, with, with pathogens and microbes and parasites, and that's really what tickles me. So, <laughs> And the cockroaches that I was playing around with had pinworms. That's why we were studying them, and that's a major theme that you're going to hear about. Parasites have parasites, and they in turn have parasites, and it's a wonderful, trophic cascade of diversity that just trickles down. <laughs> so... 
So I want to tell you about some of the highlights of my research program here at the Academy. And it's not in any means all-encompassing, but I wanted to touch on some of the things and the messages that you might want to take home with you, uh, tell your mother what you heard about tonight. And, and the two major sort of themes, or the major theme, is that evolution makes microbes, makes all forms of life in all its wonder and diversity, and that you uh, will be empowered when you leave here uh, to be a responsible host. You need to embrace your inner microbe, but at the same time, stay healthy. So we'll, we'll, we'll touch on some of those things as we go. So everybody in this room is a host. We all have had personal, intimate, deeply moving experiences with microbes <laughs> and parasitic microbes. They define who we are. They make life livable. They can make us extremely sick, so sick we wish we weren't alive anymore. So uh, what I want to talk to you about tonight is not only this personal history we've had with pathogens, but the evolutionary history that runs even deeper than that that we share with parasites. And I'm going to focus on, on three topics tonight. I'm going to talk about how evolution shapes that interaction between the host and the parasite, but across vastly different scales, one very big, one very small. And I'll talk to you specifically about the evolutionary history of a, a particular virus that's near and dear to my heart, dengue, uh, which arose in the jungles of Southeast Asia and is taking over the tropics. It's a very interesting pattern. And then finally, I want to talk to you about um, the new tools that are now available to us today, genomic tools, that are allowing us to reveal the diversity of the microbial world like never before. And it's very exciting because it tells us not only about what's the foundation of dengue evolution, but many other microbes. So uh, with that, <clears throat> I will uh, introduce another subject while I was cockroach wrangling of my PhD, which is a parasite, a parasitic worm. This is uh, a worm I discovered in fishes emerging from the gills. And I want to bring this up as an illustration of what it is to be a parasite. Parasite comes from the Greek word parasitos, and it means to dine at another's table. <laughs> so it's really a way of life, whether we're talking about a worm or a human even. My dear dad, would often refer to me as a parasite when I asked him to borrow the car, fondly. So it, it really is a way of life, and it can refer to a very complex organism such as this worm, or something even 10 times smaller than this worm, which this is a Plasmodium falciparum parasite, the agent of malaria living in a red blood cell. Much more complex, uh, much less complex than the worm, but more complex than this bacterium. This is a picture of cholera, and the cholera epidemics that occurred in Europe were, uh, gave rise to this inspirational and deadly diagram. And so, uh, what they all have in common, from me to the worm to the bacterium to viruses, is that we all evolve. And I show this picture to illustrate uh, what, how I see evolution. I'm going to talk to you about phylogenetic trees tonight as a way of organizing the diversity and finding out how things are related. But I think of a phylogenetic tree a little bit like this tree. This is a crummels. Does anybody know what a crummels is? It, it, it's a tree that's deformed. It's shaped by constant, fierce winds blowing in a single direction. And it's similar to the way the tree of life has been shaped by evolutionary forces driving, selecting for maximal fitness, reproduction, and survival to reproduce. And so we can see the pattern, the traces that evolution leaves in the tree of life, similar to the tree, uh, the way this tree is shaped by winds. The thing about evolution that's uh, so uh, uniformly interesting is not only that it shapes uh, these, these organisms and their, and their evolutionary history through selective forces, but there are also lots of random changes. And in nature around us, there's lots of variation that has been fixed randomly 
that might not have any obvious meaning or selective benefit at the moment. But that diversity is very important. It's very important uh, in the capability of a population of organisms to respond to change. And so it's the how the forces of evolution, whether they be strong positive selection to optimize fitness or whether they be uh, random uh, forces that generate uh, uh, different changes, evolution by genetic drift, we call it. What, how is evolution acting on that variation? So evolution, I said, makes microbes. And, and this is true, that evolution allows uh, pathogens. What I mean is that evolution allows pathogens to take advantage of a new environment if the diversity is present. And pathogens have an incredible capacity to store variation because they replicate so quickly. So it's this jumping or nimbleness to be able to jump into a new environment that we call emergence. So I'm going to talk a little bit about emergence. Emergence we classically think of as the appearance of a new pathogen or parasite. And I show uh, dengue virus here uh, as an example. This is a, a sylvatic or jungle cycle of dengue virus where it historically circulated amongst non-human primates and canopy-dwelling mosquitoes. A few hundred years ago, it spilled over into humans and established a human and human-adapted mosquito cycle. And that change was accompanied by genetic changes in the virus, enabling it to jump into this new host group, changes that were concentrated in the envelope gene, which uh, drove the interaction between the host cell and the virus. But that's only one example of emergence. Emergence can also be an old pathogen that has new, um, new action one example is West Nile virus in the United States, introduced in 1999. Within two years, it had spread across the entire United States. This map shows the years that it was distributed in different states, 99 in New York, progressing in the next two years to half the US, and then completely uh, represented in most states in 2002. And this sweep of West Nile virus, a virus that we've known from Africa and the Nile region for uh, centuries, uh, suddenly became an epidemic in the United States. And that emergence event of an old pathogen changing its geographic range and its virulence, for that matter, was traced to a genetic mutation that became fixed in the West Nile viruses after they immigrated to the US that changed the rate that they developed in mosquitoes. Another example that many of you might remember, the emergence of highly pathogenic avian influenza, which became a hot topic uh, a few years, several years ago. And this is an old virus. It's been around in wild birds for a long time. But it became concentrated in domestic fowl and in this highly dense, highly transmission-ready environment, it evolved into a more virulent state. Hence the emergence of the highly pathogenic Z genotype spilled back into wild birds. And the changes that were associated with the emergence of that genotype increased replication to the detriment of the birds and the human hosts that it spilled over into. So the link between evolution and the emergence of pathogens is, is highly compelling and cannot uh, be stressed enough. And it's one that's uh, been fascinating me in my research program. So evolution uh, is, is uh, to measure the pace of evolution in these interactions, we really need to consider the importance of size. And that's because size determines generation time. And evolution is iterated over generations. So the length of the generation time sets the pace of evolution. And this basic imbalance between the size of the host and the size of the pathogen, not shown to scale, is what sets an imbalanced evolutionary interaction. The pathogen always has the upper hand. It can escape our immune defenses and win the arms race almost every time. So this is dengue virus. I'm going to talk about some of the players in the dengue virus life history. Dengue virus is a billionth of a meter in size. And it turns over its genome in a matter of minutes. It 
It's a speck, a mere speck compared to this Wolbachia bacterium and the other bacteria that it coexists within the mosquito with. This bacterium is both larger and slower to evolve, but both of them are very small compared to the relatively huge mosquito, which turns over its life history in two weeks. And they, in turn, are much more nimble evolutionarily, and their pace is much greater compared to this human. This is a human leg from the previous graph, because this mosquito, Aedes mosquito, that transmits dengue, is a specialist on ankles. If any of you have run into this mosquito, you know what I'm talking about. So this is the human leg. So dengue uh, will beat out all the players in its life history. It competes uh, with Wolbachia for resources in the mosquito in, in almost all circumstances. And it evades, in most cases, most of our efforts to control the disease and our immune system to fend off the disease, although we clear it eventually. So what I want to focus on is the evolutionary history of this highly nimble and rapidly evolving pathogen to try to illustrate to you how the diversity of this virus in space and time is uh, driving its emergence in human populations today. This is a picture of the dengue virus, and these are the two principal vectors. This is the yellow fever mosquito Aedes aegypti, and this is the Asian tiger mosquito Aedes albopictus. So if any of you have been following the activity in, the, in Florida, namely the Florida Keys, you'll know that these two mosquitoes are very important in the United States. They've both invaded, and they've both been uh, responsible for some disease transmission, although Aedes aegypti is the important player in Florida. This mosquito is important too, and guess what? It's in California now. It's in the LA area, in Orange County. So the cousin of West Nile, dengue virus, could eventually colonize the western co uh, coast of the United States. So what I really want to emphasize is the how fast this virus can evolve. It's an RNA virus. It's uh, got a, a single-stranded RNA genome. Now, RNA and DNA differ in several properties, but the main one is that our DNA is copied with a high degree of fidelity. The enzymes that copy our genome are very good at what they do, and they're not likely to misincorporate a base when they're copying our genes. On the other hand, RNA does not have a proofreading mechanism, and its low fidelity gives rise to a great deal of variation every time the virus copies its genome. Most of these are mistakes. But many of them, because there are so many of them, the potential for some of them to be good hits or more fit viruses is always there. And this gives the virus its underlying uh, great rate of evolutionary innovation. So I'm going to tell you a story about where dengue virus came from a long time ago, thousands of years ago. It existed in the jungle in what we think was a very diverse community of non-human primates and many species of canopy-dwelling mosquitoes. And it, it, it diverged in that context into four main species. We call them serotypes, but they're kind of like species. And we give them very interesting names, dengue one, two, three, and four. And the order is merely based on the, the the timing of their discovery. But then, a few hundred years ago, as maybe even as much as a thousand years ago, as humans began to coalesce into um, populations that were larger and could sustain virus transmission of such, such things as dengue, the virus made a switch. And it switched over into humans, and it has since diversified. So I show the primate, non-human primate viruses in pink, falling out at the base of these human viruses. This is a phylogenetic tree. Remember I told you it's a little bit like a crumultz, always bending in one direction, shaped by evolutionary forces. And you can see that it's diversified a great deal in humans since it jumped into humans. It jumped into humans four times independently, as far as we know. 
So probably ecological pressures, recreating the opportunity to the vi for the virus to respond to this host niche opportunity. Again, coupling emergence and evolutionary nimbleness and innovation. So the virus has uh, not only continued to diversify, but it grows in human populations. So not only have we had years, the last two years of intense circulation of dengue in Florida, but we see it in Puerto Rico, we've seen it in Hawaii, and in places where it has long-standing existence, it's getting worse. More epidemics that are more severe with more serious cases. All of these viruses, each time they jumped into humans, have changes in their genome related to an a gene called the envelope gene, which confers some of its ability to get into these new host cell types. But what's been happening since? As it's been diversifying in human populations, as we see here, and growing in severity, what are the genetic changes that are underlying the spread of dengue virus and its ongoing emergence in humans? That's the question that this aspect is focused on. So it's a mystery. Dengue uh, is challenging in many ways. It causes a disease, a, fe a feverish disease called break bone fever. It's because your bones start to ache so bad it feels like they're breaking. You don't die, but you wish you would, but you don't, except in some very rare instances in which dengue virus progresses to these more severe forms, dengue shock syndrome and dengue hemorrhagic fever. You hemorrhage and then you die of shock. It's horrible. However, it's just the tip of the iceberg. What we really want to know is where these viruses come from, but more importantly, where do the 50 to 80% of the other viruses come from? So most dengue infections go completely undetected. How much variation exists here? And when does that variation pop up to create disease? Severe disease in humans and also severe epidemics. So my research program takes a comparative approach. I go to different places around the globe and I collect viruses and I isolate viruses and I study their genes to understand the com the how evolution in each of these locations has been driving a different kind of epidemic change. We have places like Puerto Rico, which has seen these increasingly severe periodic outbreaks. We've seen geographic expansion into Hawaii. We've seen incredibly um, increased rates of the severe form, the hemorrhagic form of the disease, DHF, dengue hemorrhagic fever. And then sometimes we see the opposite. All of a sudden, the virus goes into uh, undetectable transmission levels, and yet it's still there. We can detect it. So some of the tools of my trade. We collect the genomes of the viruses, and these are what we compare. These are what we use to relate the viruses to each other. It helps if they don't move around. But it's very trivial to collect the virus genomes. They're small genomes. They're 11,000 bases in length. And it allows us to ask questions. When we organize these genomes and compare them, viruses that were um, mild before that become severe in either their epidemic potential or disease potential, what's changed? So what we try to do is find the defining changes that distinguish epidemic potential. Once we locate those changes, we map them onto the genomes. This is a genome of the dengue virus with the genes delineated in these white boxes. And the different genes encode for these different proteins which have specific roles in the virus life history. So if we can find the defining changes, map them to the proper location in the genome, we can ask questions like, how might they affect the biology of the virus? We can also do, how might they affect the proteins that are generated? And we can also ask, statistic, using statistical tools, whether those changes were fixed by strong selection, whether they're adaptive, or whether they were fixed randomly. If they were fixed randomly, they still might be important. Uh, so we want to discern between the two. So this is just one uh, result, one major result, and I won't go into the others in the interest of time and to make sure you stay awake. 
But uh, this is a phylogenetic tree of one of the species of dengue virus, dengue 4, collected in Puerto Rico. In Puerto Rico, in 1998, they had the worst outbreak of dengue virus that caused more hospitalizations in their entire history. It occurred uh, here, it's, it's symbolized here, and all the viruses that were isolated from this severe outbreak fall into a group shown here in red. They all associate together. Not only do they all collect together, but they're defined by distinct mutations that became fixed in the population of dengue viruses between 1994, shown here, and most of the 94 is shown here, and 1998. And these are all the viruses that came before in, within Puerto Rico. And so we had a clue that maybe these changes were what, were what was conferring a more severe epidemic potential to these viruses. So we asked ourselves, what kind of changes are these? Are they changes that were fixed by natural selection, strong selection, or are they just random and happen to be associated with increased epidemic potential? It turns out that we can apply a statistical test to look at the codons. The codons are those triplets of bases that are translated into amino acids, which are the building blocks of the proteins that create life. And in those codons, of those three bases, sometimes one will change and it won't change the amino acid. Sometimes one will change and it will. If a base changes and it doesn't change the amino acid, we assume, big assumption, that it's neutral. It has no effect on the phenotype or outward form of the organism. So we can use that as a clock, ticking away, keeping track of neutral or non-adaptive evolution. Those codons, those bases that do cause a change in the amino acid that's encoded, those can have potentially drastic effects on the biology of the virus, on the protein. And if those occur at a much higher rate than those that don't change the amino acid, then we have a statistical signal for strong positive selection because the rate at which the ones that change the amino acid are fixed um, is much higher than the one that doesn't. So DN is the, the uh, non-silent or non-synonymous changes. DS is the silent or synonymous changes, same amino acid, and when we examined the ratio, we found that it was much, much greater than one. Over a whole section of the genome, it was actually infinitely large. Those three changes had become fixed in a background of no evolutionary neutral change of about 800 bases. So it was very exciting, and we've gone on to do more studies on this virus, testing it in different uh, experimental assays to see if we can measure its fitness relative to some of these viruses. And my postdoc is going down to Puerto Rico in a few months to conduct these experiments in mosquitoes. So there's one more uh, thing that we can derive from understanding the diversity of dengue viruses and how they change over time. And that is that we can actually extract some information about the virus population size. For example, when you select samples from a large population, they are much more genetically distant from each other than viruses that are selected from a small population. And that is that any two randomly drawn samples will take much longer to coalesce if they're drawn from a large sample. The parents are harder to find compared to a small sample. So not only can we tell when a virus is collected from a very large population, if we go backwards along the phylogenetic tree and look at how these distances have varied over time, as shown by this phylogeny, we can actually ask how the virus population has been changing over time. And this is called the coalescent. And this is very interesting because it can recover uh, populations of viruses that are growing exponentially, as we would expect in an emerging virus, an emerging pathogen. In contrast, you could actually also recover populations that were shrinking, like the Florida panthers, losing diversity, plunging in population size. So when we applied this technique to dengue virus, we were able, for the first time that a study like this has been done, to recover the cyclical pattern in dengue virus fluctuation in Puerto Rico. 
So this figure shows the cases of dengue virus in black and their periodic abundance as it changes over time in the history of dengue in Puerto Rico. In red is the trace of the estimated population size based on the coalescent. The mean is shown in solid red and then the confidence intervals are shown in dots. And it's amazing that the genetic diversity and population sizes of the virus, the base of that iceberg, the true diversity of those viruses, not just the tip of the iceberg, is tracing or tracking the periodic change in the dengue virus in terms of cases measured. This has one very important evolutionary um, impact, and that is that prior to this emergence event, the 1998 severe epidemic outbreak, which was accompanied by strong selection for a presumably more fit virus, was preceded by a population genetic crash, a crash in diversity. So you can see here the sweep, the selective sweep that generated these 1998 epidemic viruses, preceded by a crash in the genetic diversity of the virus. And this is uh, important because it means that prior to a selective sweep, random genetic changes random drops in population genetic diversity are reshuffling the deck. They're reshuffling and reducing significantly the amount of genetic variation that selection can then act upon. So drift and natural selection are both very important. And this is true in the other populations we've studied. In each case, we have found that key genetic changes do discern or distinguish those epidemic lineages, and in some cases, attenuated lineages, but they're different in every population. No gene is consistently the target of selection in dengue viruses' evolutionary history in humans. That wasn't quite the answer we were looking for. We were hoping to find the magic bullet that was generating severe viruses across the globe, but we didn't, and the answer to this is because due to the life history of the dengue virus and that it's characterized by these population genetic crashes, the variation that selection has to act upon is severely reduced, and it's reduced randomly. So it just doesn't have the same tools to act on. So diversity is compellingly important, and we can use diversity of dengue viruses to trace CSI style where the virus is emerging today find out where it's stored in, in human populations, at least. And this is a, a, a technique that we use to map the phylogenetic tree in real time, uh, tagged by where the viruses came from and how they're related, to, to find out where dengue virus is coming as it emerges throughout the tropical world. And it all implicates Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is an intense, densely populated region with lots of humans and lots of mosquitoes and lots of ties to the different population centers around. But it's a definite population hub and an evolutionary hub for dengue virus diversity and dissemination. But that's not where dengue came from originally. Dengue came from animals. And that's really another very interesting question is how is diversity stored in nature, not just in human population centers of emerging viruses? And so I was going to switch gears a little bit to hantaviruses. Hantaviruses have been in the news lately. They're in Yosemite. They're being transmitted into humans. They're spilling over into humans from rodent reservoirs. But our work has shown that although rodents are important, and you can see here lineages of rodent species, including um, mice and rats, and their hantaviruses. But even deeper than that, there's a shared evolutionary history between hantaviruses and other small mammals, and these mammals are insectivores. In most cases, the viruses and the hosts are tracking each other. They have co-phylogenetic patterns that they've um, co-evolved together, one might say. And this shows you the linkages between the virus that's found in a given host, shown in red. But occasionally, in the deep evolutionary past, 
These viruses have also shown the ability to switch into new hosts. And this is important when we think about the spillover potential into humans. And it's shown in green that several times over the evolutionary history of hantaviruses, they've switched from these uh, insectiv insectivorous small mammals into some rodents, into new insectivorous mammals, and uh, shown here and here. So this brings me back to my third topic that I want to talk to you about. Where do pathogens come from? We've talked about dengue virus, its emergence from the jungle, and its ongoing emergence from human population centers, which store an incredible amount of diversity of the virus that can respond to new opportunities. But what about other pathogens? Hantaviruses are nimble. They can switch into new hosts, have occasionally in the past. They take advantage of opportunities, concentrations of hosts, and viruses. West Nile virus in our own backyards. This is a big year for West Nile virus. It's a cousin to dengue. It's transmitted by mosquitoes. It was not here before. It's here now, and we're having a bad year. So what I really want to know is how can we use some of these amazingly new genomic tools? I showed you the genome science slide. We're now moving into an age where we have genetic tools to look at where in nature diversity is stored, whether it's communities of rodents and insectivorous small mammals or mosquitoes. This is a blood-fed female. She contains female mosquito. Only the females bite. She contains vertebrate blood meal. I think it's mine. In theory, she would also contain all the pathogens that might be in that vertebrate blood meal. She also contains her own microbes, her own parasites. This female fed so much that she passed out. But she woke up a few hours later. We put her in a tube. So she's, she was fine. It's really the gluttony of it. It's incredible. <laughs> So we can use next generation sequencing tools to drill through this organism and simultaneously reveal the hidden diversity of microbes in the blood meal, in the vertebrate she fed on, and in her own bio bio biological system. And that's been an exciting topic of my research uh, in the last couple of years. So this is applying that technology to a single host. And you can see that when I showed you that phylogeny, every tip on that tree represented the consensus virus from a single host. But underneath that single virus consensus sequence is actually a whole population of different viruses. And these se sequence traces are all different in subtle ways. So we are really bags of many, many different viruses. This was a human case, a human infection, and we tracked the change in that virus diversity over time as the patient developed fever, and then it cleared the infection. But the mosquitoes would have the same dynamic, the same wealth of virus diversity to respond to evolutionary opportunity. So what we wanted to ask was, how does this diversity within a host or amongst different hosts impact human health? Biodiversity is the variety of different organisms, forms of life, but it can go from genes to species through to different ecosystems. So it's really about differences, the many differences that exist in a community of species. This is a very biodiverse habitat, a forest environment, many different animals, microbes, mosquitoes, and on the other end of the scale is an urban environment, a low biodiversity environment. So we have a hypothesis that we want to test that as you change the biodiversity of a community, you change an individual host's relationship with its microbes or pathogens. And we've tried to symbolize that hypothesis in this slide. Again, we have the forest habitat with the different, multiple different host vertebrates potential vertebrates, many different mosquitoes. And if we drilled in using our genetic technologies, genomic technologies, into these organisms, what would we see? We hypothesized that we might see 
many different microorganisms, a highly diverse community of microorganisms. But that offsets or balances the dominance within that community of any one single kind of pathogen. We go through and downgrade our biodiversity levels into these other habitats, and we begin to see the gray bars are the hosts or vectors askew in the biodiversity spectrum. Fewer species overall and some species dominating. And the same reflected in the microorganisms. So the biodiversity of the vertebrate and mosquito communities, the megafauna reflected in the biodiversity of the microorganisms. At the far end of the spectrum, we have this environment. A single host, a human, or the mosquitoes that have adapted to feed on humans, like Aedes aegypti, dominate the community of megafauna and in turn set the stage and allow for the dominance of the transmission community by one or a few pathogens. And when a pathogen dominates in such a way, it creates an epidemic. So we might think of West Nile virus as being represented by this graph. Maybe something like Nipah virus or Ebola virus, viruses that are mainly in animal reservoirs and rarely spill over into humans represented by these kinds of patterns. So we're taking advantage of our genomic technology. These are, these are de novo, anonymously, uh, anonymous sequencing capabilities. We don't need to know what we're looking for. We can just sequence all the genomic signatures in a pool, whether that pool be a mosquito, its blood meal, or its own hemolymph. So we're going to take advantage of this mosquito and its predilection for sampling hosts, we're going to think of it as a mini hypodermic needle flying around, taking sips here, sips there, biting an ankle, biting a gecko, and sampling a whole community of vertebrates and retaining them and their parasites in the blood meal, and then they in turn. And by doing this, we can then sample the mosquitoes and get a much bigger multi-trophic picture of the biodiversity of an environment, including its microbes. So we set up a study in Thailand. We uh, targeted a region in central Thailand that had a range of different kinds of habitats, and we set up a gradient that ran from a national park, a highly diverse park in central Thailand that actually has the highest diversity of mammals in all of Thailand, through to a town, a, an urban environment, Nekonayok, and you can see some pictures here showing you how the habitat changes as we move from Khao Yai National Park to Nekonayok. And we sampled mosquitoes. We wanted to use as many traps as we could so we wouldn't be biased in the kinds of mosquitoes we were sampling. So we have here um, my graduate student aspirating with a backpack aspirator. Looks just like Ghostbusters. It's true. That's what she was doing. Sampling mosquitoes around homes, in and around homes, and in, in places where animals were kept. This is a BG, light, uh, BG trap. It, it uh, attracts mosquitoes by virtue of the fact that it offers a safe resting place, and it can be baited with, uh, with bait, carbon dioxide, the mimic a breathing vertebrate. And then we use this mosquito magnet, which has a similar way of attracting mosquitoes. It uses carbon dioxide and heat to mimic a human body or a vertebrate and pull, pull mosquitoes in. And this is a CDC light trap, which attracts mosquitoes uh, that are attracted to the light. So we wanted to get a diversity of different mosquitoes so that we could get a diversity of their microbes. And indeed, we picked up a wide diversity of mosquitoes. These are pie charts to show you the different kinds of mosquitoes and their relative abundances. The habitats were very different. This is me with my graduate students sampling a rice field, which is intermediate in terms of its biodiversity. This is me setting up a light, light trap in the jungle environment. And this is after a hard day of field work. My daughter's exhausted. She makes good mosquito bait, too. I shouldn't, I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> NIH will get upset. So we, 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 uh, we did indeed reveal that the diversity of microbes that we captured in our mosquito communities 
were more diverse, was higher in more diverse habitats. So this figure shows you the expected number of operational taxonomic units. That is, it's a unique sequence. We don't know what it is, but it's different. And in this case, we were focusing on bacteria. And you can see here that in all cases, the line that recovers the higher number of new signatures per effort of sequencing is highest in these rural environments. Green here, green here, and shown in blue here. So rural environments relative to suburban environments are more diverse. We took a, a, a heat map approach to now drilling into looking at the characteristics of these microbes. And you can see here that the um, microbes shown, the, the, the color shows their relative abundance. And then on this side, it classifies the different microbes. Uh, some of these microbes uh, are, are very significant. They include Wolbachia. We even found a Wolbachia in Aedes aegypti, which is not supposed to have it. It turned out it was a nematode Wolbachia that's a parasite of, 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 of these Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, a dirofilaria. So again, parasites of parasites of parasites. So the pattern, the signature of not only the abundance, the diversity of microbes, but who's where is also very distinct depending on the habitat. We have um, Aedes aegypti from urban and suburban environments separating out from Aedes from rural environments, and we have Aedes albopictus off on its own as having a very distinct signature. So my research program at the academy while continuing to use dengue and hold it up as a model organism for studying specific uh, emergence events related to functional diversity of the dengue genome, is ongoing with my program to delve deeper into the distribution of microbes, not only bacteria, but viruses in mosquitoes as a representative of the transmission communities that they've co-evolved in. And so we're going to be uh, going onwards from the Thailand study to many other places in the world where dengue and other arboviruses are very relevant, uh, using mosquitoes as our indicators of biodiversity. And those include, we have some projects going on in Puerto Rico, ongoing in Trinidad, in Costa Rica, in Hawaii, in the South Pacific, Tahiti, French Polynesia, and of course Thailand. So it's going to be fun. My daughter's getting older, so it should be even more help. <laughs> so I want you to uh, take home two main messages. One is that evolution makes microbes. We can't fight evolution. It's natural. But we can be responsible hosts, and that is that we need to break the chain of transmission. So I always tell people, wash your hands, cover your mouth when you cough, and Visually inspect your stool on a regular basis for blood, fat, or anything that moves. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we're going to open it up to questions from the audience at this time. And if you raise your hands, I'll come around with a microphone. Right. Um, so my understanding of the way that people usually uh, fight dengue um, outbreaks is by trying to control the mosquitoes. But is it possible to use some of your research to fight it uh, on a smaller level? Um, so there is actually no antivirals that are effective against dengue. And many of the antivirals that work against hepatitis C, which is in the same family, and even HIV, which attacks the way the virus uh, replicates, are ineffective against dengue and West Nile, for that matter. So there are research labs that are more capable than I of investigating that further, and they do have some other candidates that work with the, um, the complementarity of the virus diversity within a host. But what's really exciting is that um, two things, the big things in dengue this year is that a vaccine uh, the results of a vaccine are being released in the next week or so, and it's in phase three trials, and it seems to be fairly effective. That could change everything. 
And luckily, I have the mosquitoes as a backup in case I'm out of a research job. But um, <laughs> the other major, major thing is that mosquito control has really reached new heights of effectiveness with two major events. One is that uh, we, they um, invented a genetically modified mosquito, an Aedes aegypti, which they've been releasing in Brazil. And those, um, those data are out. And it reduces mosquito populations so that they can break the chain of transmission of dengue. And then the other study that's coming out in a week or so, the results of which we've seen is very exciting, and it's the replacing of mosquito populations in Australia with a mosquito that contains a Wolbachia that makes the mosquito resistant to dengue virus. So we're really on the eve of a change in the way uh, dengue occurs in the world. It's very exciting. We'll take our next question from the back of the room. Uh, can uh, mosquitoes transmit all known viruses to humans? Oh, so, all known viruses um, are really a diverse collection of organisms. And some of them, only a small fraction of them, are actually mosquito borne. Some of them are transmitted directly, some of them are tick borne, uh, others are, um, uh, we don't know. We don't know how they're transmitted amongst humans. So, uh, no, they can't. But it's the ones that uh, do transmit in mosquitoes that particularly interest me because they represent uh, a very dynamic link between humans and their pathogens that I love to study to see how the mosquitoes are also evolving. Hi. In an area like um, Puerto Rico where it's a high level of endemicity, I don't know if yeah. you'd say. <laughs> right. um, what percentage of people are positive for dengue? You know, that's a really interesting question. Um, dengue occurs throughout the tropics. And if you uh, sample people randomly in a room like this in Thailand, 90% of people would be seropositive for dengue. That means you have antibodies to dengue. And that hits 90% after the age of six, school age. If you go to Puerto Rico and you take an average, it really depends on the age group. And it hovers at the highest about um, 40 to 60 to maybe even 80 percent. And it peaks in, in working uh, age men and women in their 20s. So what we think is actually a random selection of the population is not that indicative, that maybe dengue in Puerto Rico has hot spots of transmission. And you, if you sampled local hosts, you would find that seropositivity was higher in certain areas than in others. So there hasn't really been a geographically fine study of dengue rates in Puerto Rico. Can you talk about how global warming will affect these microbes? Yeah, that's a huge um, area of interest and debate. It's rather a hot topic, actually. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, there's, it's complicated, and I hate that answer whenever I get it, but it really is in that um, when, you, when you warm up a mosquito, you speed up its development. You also speed the rate up rate of development of the virus in the mosquito. So p potentially, uh, increasing temperature could have an enormous effect on the number of viruses and the transmission events that could occur. However, often when you increase temperature, you decrease humidity. And with a decrease in humidity, mosquito survival drops significantly. And so it could be there, there, there could be a trade-off in some populations as opposed to others. I just came from a really um, interesting meeting in the South Pacific where people who, communities that live on atolls are looking at a densification of their communities in response to global uh, change and rising sea levels because they're losing coastal habitat. And so as humans densify, the mosquitoes will also densify. And of course, both of these mosquitoes are moving rapidly around the world just with growing socioeconomic interactions and globalization and flying. So all of these issues are going to accompany uh, climate change. And so, we, so there, are, there, were, uh, there are modelers that are working on this. And the consensus is that we need to uh, fine tune our, 
our predictive models to, uh, to match specific habitats where different things might be important. There's not one thing that might be important in all instances. And then if we can calibrate those models with real data as we go, we'll have a much better sense. Another question, if we have Aedes aegypti coming into California, do we have to worry about yellow fever? So um, the, the, uh, the mosquito that's established in LA, LA area, Orange County, I believe it is, uh, and there's a wonderful group of people called the Mosquito California Mosquito Vector and Control Association that are monitoring these things. They're monitoring uh, mosquitoes and they're monitoring rodents and, and other things and Lyme disease. And uh, they... Um, reported Aedes albopictus, which is the Asian tiger mosquito. So the good news is, probably not yellow fever, but the bad news is chikungunya. Who's heard of chikungunya? It's almost as bad as dengue, arguably worse than dengue, and Aedes albopictus is a great vector. It was introduced into Italy and uh, parts of southern Europe a few years back. Concomitantly, dengue showed up chikungunya showed up, and so now Europe has a problem. So, uh, obviously, you know, people are screening mosquito pools on a regular basis to look for the presence of West Nile virus, dengue, chikungunya, and other hits. California encephalitis virus, we're surrounded. <laughs> a, a question on your um, gradient from forest to suburban areas. Is there any particular zone where you have kind of a higher tendency for more to cultivate a more virul virulent virus, meaning that in the suburban city areas you have one host and multiple viruses, so to speak, but you have multiple hosts with one virus in your kind of agro area? Um, so, so this is a this is a great question. There are, uh, and to to tell you the truth, the data is is ongoing, and we've taken our first cut by looking at bacteria, and we haven't looked at the viruses yet, in part because the field work was very challenging, and RNA viruses are very unstable. So we're really optimizing some of our methods to to um, enhance. Um, the, the virus component of those biodiversity samples. But there are mosquito species that have, particular species that have more diverse microbes than others. And part of that, we think, we're still, you know, analyzing the data, but we hypothesize that might, they might be more of a generalist kind of vector. So they might feed on more of a greater variety of hosts than, say, the three top medically important uh, vectors that I focused on when I showed you those, those curves, which, they, you know, they really do have a much more narrow host range in terms of the vertebrates they feed on. So we expect the microbes to reflect that. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about your uh, advice for people to wash their hands all the time. Um, does this mean that you're not a proponent of the hygiene hypothesis? So uh, when I say wash your hands, I mean just plain old soap and water. And what I'm really talking about is maintaining the balance of a healthy uh, community of microbes on your hands. I'm not a proponent of using an alcohol hand wash station to eliminate most of the microbes that do belong there and possibly selecting for the microbes that don't but could outcompete the ones that do. So I, I think general hygiene is a good thing. Uh, Does anybody know the hygiene hypothesis? It's really fascinating. It, it's basically that throughout our evolutionary history, our immune system has evolved to combat uh, pathogens and other microorganisms that we regularly used to encounter. All of a sudden, here we are in the modern world and we are no longer encountering those microorganisms, those pathogenic or parasitic microorganisms that our immune system has adapted to fight, and so it now has nothing to focus on. It has nothing to do. It's twiddling its thumbs, and it says, okay, so in, in lieu of the fact that it's primed and ready, it attacks self. And so we're seeing an increase in modern uh, communities of um, 
immune-related diseases, self-autoimmune-related diseases like asthma, um, eczema, um, arthritis, lupus. And so I think it's a, it's a great question. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't really, uh, you know, recommend that we all go out and eat tapeworm eggs to balance our immune system, <laughs> but, but I, I'm following uh, the research that's being done on the hygiene hypothesis. I think it's a very challenging hypothesis to test because there are so many other things going on. There are more toxins in our environment. That's an alternative hypothesis to the hygiene hypothesis. Thank you. After recovering from, after recovering from dengue fever, is one essentially immunized? Yeah, well, <laughs> you're immunized to that serotype or species that you got you're actually more likely to get sicker if you get one of the other forms. So it's really been uh, a, a big challenge. It's why the vaccine has been so difficult to develop, because we cannot immunize people to one. You're immunized for life to the one that you're exposed to, but you're more susceptible to severe disease by any of the others. So we had to immunize people to all four at once. And they're very different. They're very different viruses in that they grow differently, they look different in cell culture, they make different kinds of plaques. They're different, they're biologically different. And so when you try to make a cocktail of vaccine against all four, invariably one would outcompete the others. And so you get a skewed immune response, which could set people up for um, severe disease if they're in endemic areas, and that's where we want to use the vaccine is places where the viruses are all circulating. So it's been a challenge, but finally, they've developed a vaccine that um, uses, uh, a, it's ge genetically engineered. It has a, a, a backbone. The one that's in trial three is a, a yellow fever backbone, a, an attenuated form of yellow fever virus that has inserted into it the immunogenic genes, the ones that give rise to your immune response, uh, representing each dengue virus. So there's a a backbone with an insert for dengue one, another one for dengue two, three, and four. And these have all been uh, calibrated because they use a con constant background. They're easier to balance. And uh, it looks very promising. I think the only, the only challenge is that it's expensive to make. And we've got to be able to use it in places where people don't have a lot of money or resources to really make a difference. I noticed in your photos that a lot of people are in short sleeves. <laughs> when you're in endemic areas, do you take any precautions to not get bitten? And if so, what do you do? Yes. Um, we, we do uh, wear, we wear mosquito repellent. Um, we try not to use DEET because it kills our sample before we're really ready. <laughs> and, we, and we don't want to repel them. So, so actually, um, you know, you really caught me out because in general, I recommend, and nowadays, I always wear long sleeves. Because really, long sleeves when you're doing field work is the best way to protect against scratches from poisonous plants, as well as mosquito bites, and ticks, and other things. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap things up this evening. Please join me in extending a warm thank you to Shannon Bennett. <laughs>